if you rescued a little bat, for example, it's baby, you need to feed it milk every, all through the night because bats um, uh, are awake in the night, right? So they will feed in the night as well. Right. So they're eternal creatures. So, you know, these little volunteers will stay awake and they'll use a little, uh, like a earbud or a little dropper and keep feeding bats and mammals. So they right. keep feeding it a drop of milk, cleaning it. And, um, and you know, this little bat uh, would cry each time the person would put it back, you know, into its little box. So right. and the moment they would open the box, it would come on, cling to the t-shirt and be fine. Right. But then they understood that, okay, we need to put a little, maybe a toy uh, next to it, you know, right. so that it can uh, right. uh, cling onto it. And then, and then it kept quiet. And thank you so much for joining us today on another uh, episode, if I could call it, of Dialogues That Matter. Um, if you've been following us, you know that today's topic is something of great importance uh, because it is something that we deeply believe in. It's about harmony and the way that we must all exist or rather coexist with each other between animals and humans. Um, we have someone uh, who uh, has dedicated her life uh, to kind of bring this to the forefront, Alpana Bhartia from People for Animals. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alpana. Hi, Shruti. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you for giving this platform. To yes. We are super excited to have you here today. Uh, and I think uh, before we get going in, into the topic, which is about urban wildlife and how in the urban scape, um, the wildlife interact with our lives and how that kind of, uh, how we can be a little more mindful of their presence and vice versa. Before we get into that, I'd like to introduce um, Alpana to those of you who don't know her. Uh, do keep in mind, this is going to be an interactive session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop questions uh, in the comment section. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, so Alpana Bhatia has been actively involved in uh, animal welfare for the last 25 years. As the founder trustee of People for Animals, Bangalore, her passion and vision was instrumental in driving the organization to success. She's a writer and educator and has written numerous articles on animal welfare. And apart from giving talks in various institutions, she has taught environmental science in St. Joseph's High School. Um, she, has been, uh, she had been nominated by the government of India on the Committee of Control and Supervision of Experiments on Animals. She was also on the Institution Ethics uh, Committee of National Center for Biological Studies in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. She's an avid organic farmer and promotes the use of our traditional uh, uh, is that Riksha Yar, uh, Yadurvik? Riksha Ayurveda. Riksha Ayurvedic systems, uh, which is fascinating. I'd like to know about that as well. Um, and I think, you know, the laurels just go on and on. Uh, a little bit about People for Animals. People for Animals uh, was basically founded in Bangalore in 1996 by Namrata, Alpana, and Gauri, as well as Arushi. It is a non profit animal welfare organization formed under the na nationwide initiative and vision of. Uh, Mrs. Menka Gandhi. Over the years, uh, it has been evolved uh, in issues that have crossed various boundaries, which includes the illegal slaughter of camels, ostrich farming, the disbanding of an elephant training camp, um, halting the mobile zoo display of animals in Mangalore, and then the list is just on and on. Um, and um, thank you for the work that you do, because I think uh, it is something that is uh, required in these times. Uh, let's just get right uh, to it. Uh, the first question is, uh, talk to us a little about what PFA does. Uh, and uh, can you talk to us about what is it that, uh, you know, at which uh, part of the stage do you kind of intervene? Do you do care of animals? Do you do aftercare? Do you rescue animals? Do you also do education? What is it that you do? So uh, we do, firstly, all everything. Right. From, from the rescue stage to the rehabilitation to the treatment right. and then eventually to the release. Right. So I you know in a wildlife, it's it's wild. It cannot be contained. Correct. So the efforts have to uh, you know bring it back to um, its home, which is the wild. Correct. And that means get it out as fast as possible from our rehabilitation and care center. Right. And uh, so, but we need to make sure that the animal is uh, hale and hearty to fend for itself. Right. Um, so we have all various periods, you know, some are like displaced snakes, you know, we, uh, our most uh, rescued animal uh, is the cobra. Right. So most of them 
like you may find uh, in the morning you uh, go to your puja room and you may find a cobra there because now you have to think why would the cobra be in your puja room it's not because it's like only for shiva or uh, ganesha and you know and it's in vishnu you know it's the right. bed of vishnu is a snake the girdle of the ganesha is a snake the, and uh, shiva it's around the throat so in every form it's there but actually it's there because the rat has come before that correct you know, the rat has come to probably you put some prasadam right. and the rat has come to eat the prasadam right and the snake um, you know it'll follow the footsteps or rather the smell of the rat so whichever path the rat has taken the snake will come as for that right and um, so probably if it's trapped and it's got the snake i mean the rat and it's eaten it so it can't it's lethargic at that time it can't right. leave the same right. route that it came yeah so that's why it's still there or it could be in your toilet it could be in your kitchen you know we've got rescues from um in the piping in the ducting of our kitchens our toilets in the wc in the uh, buckets of water you know when it's dry outside then you know snakes need rehydration so they may just come where there's moisture right. but again it's always associated with their food first you know correct correct it's rat it's right. uh, you know your open garbage or even we tend to clutter you know keep stuff just uh, thrown you know we and just out of the open. To, correct save everything and you know sometimes becomes a clutter and you know it becomes an ideal hiding hiding spot hiding for rat yes so we will do all kinds of you know from all processes right. so uh, like so the display snake we will release immediately like after um, checking establishing that it's healthy it's not been injured then okay. it would be released asap within a few hours but uh, the longest i think we will hold on to is uh, like the baby monkeys mm-hmm. um the mother might have gotten electrocuted and then the surprising thing is like it's in, like it's an amazing thing actually when the mother falls after being electrocuted uh, like a hands or whatever some shock she's got she leaves her limbs leave the um, uh, whatever she's holding on to she falls in such a way that the baby is not damaged you know she, the baby is safe right. so we have so many where the mother dies but the baby is safe that's right. really amazing so right. those uh, primate the new nates the babies uh, we have to nurture right up to uh, in beyond infanthood um there also we have a very interesting thing we have these two um, macaques which are blind so they could never be released back in the uh, wild so those right. are the only creatures we have a few macaques which are with us for lifetime care captivity in captivity every right. other animal leaves right so these two uh, the blind macaques they are the foster mothers of these uh, orphans and it's okay. very interesting so first we hand rear them till you know bottle feed them uh, uh, give them a space you know where we have hammocks and swings and ropes so they can you know stretch their limbs and develop their muscles right. and then they go on to uh, being with their mother uh, with these little foster at the same time it could be got it yeah. uh, with this uh, foster mummies and uh, where they learn to you know cling together right get confidence you know learn some skills so uh, and then uh, so they could be with us for 6 months till they reach a stage where they are independent right. eating on their own learning to forage learning to uh, social skills because they survive in a group right right and I mean, uh, and am i right to assume that what you largely deal with urban wildlife so this is wildlife that is uh, uh, intertwined with our urban uh, scape or is it also uh, wild animals that you uh, kind of interact with so um i think is urban wildlife okay which means uh, any creature which is found in the city which is not domestic like that means right. not a cat cow, right. cow horse donkey right. dog so but we do get sometimes you know creatures like a pangolin it could be okay. coming okay. from the rail seema district of andhra pradesh right. where the sand comes from you know the dry river beds the sand is loaded and brought to construction sites right so when the sand is picked up in by the truckers then the pangolin has formed a ball you know when it uh, is threatened it curls into a little tight ball right. so it could have got shoveled onto the into the truck with the sand 
right, then it's right. unloaded in Bangalore. Right. And then somebody, you know, sometimes we've got a call that I've got a dinosaur, you know, I've got a dinosaur in my garage. Right. I don't know what to do. So then we go there and we find it's a pangolin, you know, it's a very ancient animal with scales and it's beautiful. Right. Right. And, and it's like, and, you know, it controls the termites and it's vital to the health of our forests and um, and also they're traded for their scales. Uh, they're sold in the you know, market, uh, underground market to, right. uh, you know, for Chinese medicines, the scales are sold. That, I mean, there's a lot of sad right. trade that goes on. Right. So um, it's interesting how, and then, you know, we'll have volunteers coming into the shelter and they'll all be looking for ants, you know, little ant uh, nests, you know, fire, fire ants, which uh, weave a kind of a nest in the trees. Right. They right. go and cut it and then they leave it for the pangolin to eat it. Right. So um, it's interesting. The, we right. love to have volunteers, you know, with the, our citizens interact with the, and to know what are the animals in Bangalore. So right. that is one of the wilder creatures which has come from outside of, uh, yeah. Right. Wow. This is just for those of us who don't know who, what a pangolin is. Yeah. So yes, that's right. that's... Up, yeah. It's a curled up one here. Yes. Yes. Uh, then we get slender loris. You know, slender loris is uh, the kadupapu, which is the state animal of Karnataka. Okay. And it was found from Indian Institute of Science. Oops, sorry. Uh, no to um, uh, you know, like the whole belt from Indian Institute of Science to the palace grounds to um, the Kaban Park. You know, contiguous chain right up to Banargata. Right. But now it's all got fragmented. Right. So these um, are really tiny, you know, the, as small as my fist. These are little mm -hmm. primates, nocturnal with big eyes. Okay. And they are still found in Bangalore. They are still found in Kaban Park. And, uh, in, right. In, what did you say they're called again? Could you mention that again? Papu, Papu, uh, slender Loris. Slender Loris. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pick out a picture so people can yeah, see this as well. Very cute. While, while we get at that, uh, can you uh, talk to me a little about uh, the importance to uh, speak, uh, kind of speak about how uh, we need to coexist as, uh, because like you rightly mentioned, it is wildlife that is inhabited in an urban space, rather we have kind of inhabited their spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Could you talk to us a little bit about that and how um, kind of, um, how uh, I mean, uh, I mean, how did this uh, kind of come about? And uh, you know, what are your observations that you have kind of seen um, in today's day and age with the way uh, you know urban wildlife is treated per se? See, uh, mostly, what if I ask you, name me six uh, animals that you have noticed in your city? Right. Uh, wild wild animals. Yeah, right. that's a one. Right. So, if I ask people. Uh, name me six wild creatures that you've seen in Bangalore. Right. You know, ten, you know, they say ten. Uh, right. People say um, squirrel, monkey, crow. Right. And they'll think dog, no, no, that's not wild. Uh, horse, that's not wild. Donkey, that's not wild. So then, you know, it's a struggle. Right. We only have already treated more than 203 species. That means right. the different kinds of wildlife right. in Bangalore. Right. So what we need to do, what we also working with school children that uh, to observe, you know, right. How many species of birds are visiting. And yes, even the squirrel is your wildlife. It's such an important uh, part, you know, like, and to understand how important they are. Right. And what is their value? Like, Correct. you know, recently the uh, Supreme Court has announced that the, each tree is worth 75,000 rupees into its number of years of age. Right. There's a commercial value. That's also, I think, still less from what right. it actually is. Right. So like a squirrel, who can gauge a squirrel's worth? Right. And that squirrel's fecal matter has got this micro uh, fungi. Uh, so basically when the um, squirrel is living on a tree, its fecal matter drops. And that fecal matter has um, nitrogen fixating bacterial culture in it. Okay. So that is a symbiotic. The tree needs it. Right. And it, it gives it a good strata to grow in the tree. So right. a squirrel is so important. So then 75,000 is the tree. Then how much do you value a squirrel? Correct. You know, so like that, right. we need to think. Like everything is of value. Snakes. Right. If you didn't have snakes, like people 
are so fearful because of you know myths and superstitions and movies that we have seen like you know anaconda and snake attack and mamba zamba i don't know right but, but right snakes if left alone prime of facey if left alone and with sense sensible moving in darker spaces cluttered spaces outdoor spaces like you know you're supposed to take a staff and you know thump it so the snake right. feels the vibration and moves out of your way right are uh, there hardly any incidents you know so many people there's so many many snakes in bangalore people don't realize it but they are the ones who are the actual controllers of rodents right if we didn't have snakes if the farmers didn't have snakes we would lose far more than the 25% of the you know uh, crop wastage crop. that we really yeah. have yeah the 25% is already lost to rodents yeah. we would yeah. lose much more yeah. and it's there in our urban sphere also it's not only to do with the farmer it's right. there right in bangalore we have people calling us oh it's there inside my motorcycle you know car window you know where earlier we used to have those roll down car window or thing so where that uh, rolling point was there we would have a snake curled up we've had snake rescues from uh, bangalore international airport inside a luggage it was right. being uh, you know taken out smuggled out so right. it's there in our city we need to learn that bangalore has wildlife huge amounts we are in the midst of various uh, forest zones correct even if a city which is not in forest like for example it's not that green will still have a huge amount of wildlife so we need right. to be you know sensitive to them and and seek them out you know look look at the wonders the mysteries that each one reveals to us right and how you know the interaction it's Correct. symbolic it's so important for us right especially right. Like, like even bees bees and butterflies if we didn't have them i mean uh, uh, um, at least a thousand products are only dependent on bees butterflies and animals for pollination or the you know, uh, species that we use right. you know, commercially we use right. medicine 80 of the medicines i think are pollinated by bats like right. medicinal trees plants right if we didn't have bats we wouldn't have about 80 of our medicines right so bats are hugely important for seed dispersal for pollination for controlling of pests you know the mosquitoes the bugs which fly in the night right a, a small bird parent two parents would make a thousand trips to catch little insects to feed their uh right veg. right so awesome the nature and i think bangalore is blessed and we have very good citizens right uh, to be able to do all these rescues firstly we need a citizen to call us up right somebody has to right. notice that an animal is in distress Correct. and only they take the trouble to you know find a number you know first you'll google or you call the police and the police might give you hours or nowadays you know google takes you far further correct so then they'll call us and then they they need to be around we just you just can't say oh on a particular tree i noticed one injured bird correct i need you there to ensure that that animal is still there when we arrive to make sure it's not attacked by dogs cats humans children correct or other birds you know correct so keep in fact i think correct sorry go ahead yeah so to keep that animal safe we so we need public participation which is very important and we do have it bangalore's uh, got a fabulous uh, citizenry you know that's why we've reached about 25 uh, 7000 animals i think or uh, more than that right right wildlife, only wildlife right right i think that was uh, it it kind of brings back the point that you said right to be observant and to be a little more sensitive about the creatures around us and the way they are interacting with us and the way you know like you said to be able to identify an animal in distress um, is one of the key things so could you talk to us a little about um, something that you brought up and you uh, said that uh, you know it is of importance to talk about it uh, we recently had makar sankranti and in a lot of uh, uh, places around the country during makar sankranti you know they fly the kite right um and similarly just through the uh, through the year you did uh, mention that uh, and i'm sure a lot of such activities i'm sure this is just one activity could you talk to us a little about how such activities can harm you know the different uh, creatures whether they're on land in air in water and so on i think uh, we as humans and having a higher much higher intellect and ability to harness our powers and uh, control other creatures but 
we must examine, you know, a simple sport which looks like a hobby, a simple hobby of kite flying, you know, the toy, the kite, hobby kite. When it flies in the sky, earlier we just had cotton threads. You know, Correct. we had thin cotton thread. Then came the uh, thing of crushing glass and coating it. Right. Which is, again, you know, the moment you think of crushed glass, glass is, uh, you think of violence, you know. I right. mean, it can be a murder weapon. You do right. have uh, uh, glass as murder. You can get hurt if you break a glass and you step on it. It can hurt us so much. Similarly, we need Correct. to think, you know, what happens to the birds that are flying. We get Correct. so many birds caught in the... Uh, and nowadays those manja, the thread is called manja. Right. Nowadays right. we have the synthetic manja. Now the right. synthetic manja just doesn't break. The kite can, the birds can struggle and struggle and struggle, but it doesn't break. The right. cotton thread would just snap or over time, you know, even if it's there, the bird can pull it out, you know, uh, with its beak. Uh, it can dissolve with rain or in water. You know, it right. dissolves, right. it disintegrates. But right. this plastic synthetic thing is like a like a sword through the bird. You right. know, it slices through the wings, through the underbelly, through the necks. Right. In Gujarat, we've had so many people dying because uh, of uh, like they put on the scooters, they put this wire, you know, as tall as almost two feet, a U-shaped wire, so okay. that catches the uh, plastic uh, manja thread. Otherwise, people have been slit on the throat right. and done. Right. So similarly, the same thing happens with the birds. And that's right. a huge menace. And right. we get so many calls, you know, from tall trees, a bird hanging by a thread. And, you know, it's fluttering, it's flapping, it's in distress. And it's a very inhumane thing for a child right. to see and yeah. not be able to do anything. Yeah. I'm like seeing this creature shrieking, crying for help. And I'm unable to do anything. It's very painful. And then these kind of incidents either can dehumanize us. You know, as a child, I can feel I will learn to protect my heart because I'm feeling so bad, but I can't bear that. So I learn to disassociate myself with that pain. Right. And I become oblivious to that, the pain of another creature. Right. I think uh, what you did bring up, right? As a kid, when you see something like this, it does... Uh, kind of scarred you or it kind of puts you in distress yourself, right? Uh, yeah. That kind of brings me to an important point, uh, which is that perhaps as kids and at that level itself, uh, to be able to teach kids and to be able to tell kids to be a little more aware of the kind of uh, uh, species, creatures uh, and things around us, right? So kids from that age can be a little more uh, aware. So, you know, if a kid is told that, you know, uh, when you fly a kite, you know, the manja has this and it could be a threat to the animals or just to be aware in general uh, would help uh, the cause for sure, right? What is your take on that? Do you think it, it is yeah. important to teach these kids at Very a young important. age? We've been having school children over to our shelter to, you know, have a, a particular school will organize a visit and, you know, the children will come and it'd be two or three hours. We take them around, we'll show them the kind of work we're doing, right. sensitize them and at the end, you know, we'll have a uh, look back, you know, what did you take away from this uh, experience? Right. And then eventually if so, uh, the children who would like to take a pledge, they pledge that, you know, they will protect uh, the animals around them. Right. And a child uh, is very, 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 you know, um, their intentions are so good that at that uh, very younger age, they know, yeah. maybe age eight to 10 years, 12 years of age, all these children then after seeing a work, they all say, I want to become a vet. Right. All yeah. want to become wet, said that. Yeah. Region. And that's how you sensitize them that, hey, all is not lost. You know, if one, if you decide to do something for any one creature, you can do it. You know, Correct. you need to act. You need right. to have that intent and you need to act upon it. And right. I think what we bring is that if you have that intent, then there is a place where that animal can go to. That's, right. that's already been there. It's already been established for you. So it's become many steps easier. Right, right. So, of course, this is just uh, this is just one side to it, right? That is to kind of give information to kids from a very young age, so they are kind of aware, and then to make that accessible, right? The other side to it is um, things like, um, do we have a law in place for uh, you know the treatment and care for such animals? Uh, perhaps someone like you would be able to tell us with a little more clarity. If not, why don't we? Oh, we have very stringent laws regarding wildlife. Even right. if you 
catch uh, that kite which is dangling from the thread. If you catch it and imprison, I mean, hold it, it's called, it's held as imprisonment of the, of right. the kite. Right. You cannot hold any wildlife in captivity, whether it's okay. a squirrel or whether it's a kite, crow, all of them come under the protection of the Indian uh, Wildlife Act of 1972. That's stringent, but okay. it's not really enforced. You know, I mean, there's so much of other things for, um, and also uh, police forces also need um, awareness and understanding, you know. Correct. And um, I think like we now, uh, because of COVID last year, we had a lot of Zoom uh, meetings with schools, you know. So schools are using it hugely. And um, see, domestic animals, we have a very little fine. Um, it was just as little as 50 rupees for cruelty to, you could uh, push a, a puppy a, a puppy over your terrace roof and the fine was only 50 rupees. Okay. So we've really been fighting for that litigation to be changed. You know, we've, so we do uh, work on the litigation part. Right. That becomes an all India movement. Ms. Menka Gandhi comes to the forefront. Right. But at the local level, we work with schools a lot. We right. have a legal team at PFA, so people can call up, email us, okay. and we guide them. Like this is what you can do if you see any cruelty to any animal, and you would like to help. But you can't just push it onto us. You know, we are also right. just a little bunch of small right. bunch of people who are all doing uh, something. Right. I'm just, I'm as a volunteer. I mean, I'm not paid anything. I've been doing it for 25 years, but it's a voluntary service. So, right. so we expect you to bring, put in that half an hour, one hour, whatever to brings it to, right. uh, 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 you know, bring it to a conclusion. Right. But we will assist you. We will support you. We will guide you. We'll give you the laws and we will assist you if it requires a police case or whatever. I mean, that's really a far-fetched end of the situation. Right. But Smaller help we are there to provide. What about the uh, you know illegal holding of animals or poaching and like you mentioned uh, the different uh, purposes of different animals that we aren't even aware of, right? For instance, what is that like? Sorry, like poaching and all. I will say, um, see, we do have even in Bangalore we have the urban forest, right? In uh, like just next to our shelter in Kengeri, we have the Turahalli forest, okay. and there we have deer and. Um, very often in the summer months when it's really dry, the deer kind of uh, venture out looking for water. So now right. what we started doing, we've started replenishing the water source in the Turahalli forest. Right. Or you, and then once a deer comes out, it's very scared. It's always a very edgy animal, you know, it panics, dogs can attack it. And it, it's a very sad thing that happens. Right. So even in the urban areas, we do find traps laid out uh, in more early days now, Bur Bangalore's got too big, too uh, too urbanized. Right. Uh, maybe a decade back, we were still straddling between rural, urban in the similar what has now become totally urban. Correct. Uh, the same urban sphere was more half rural, half urban. Correct. So we Correct. did have traps and uh, things. So um, we will guide. We do have many teams who will go and uh, assist at that spot. Right. If right. it's uh, poaching and entrapment. Right. And then we will, would like to book the culprit and bring him to uh, bring it to full justice. Right. And uh, in so many years that you have, uh, you know, interacted with wildlife, what are some of the most, uh, I mean, let's go both the spectrums. What are some of the most horrific things you've seen and what are some of the most uh, perhaps compassionate or really nice things that you have seen? Uh, some of the horrific things are the mutilation of the slender laurels. Right? Okay. Okay. Uh, mutilation of the civet cat, right. mutilation of the cobra, you know, where the cobra's, um, the venom sac is on the side of the mouth. It's, you can just slit a cobra and take out, remove the venom snacks, uh, sac. Okay. And then these snake charmers would use, you know, go around with these little baskets, you know, cane baskets. Right. And on Nag Panchmi, on, on, on every day, they would go to various shopkeepers and people on the roads and uh, you know, the Indian mentality is like a uh, snake means it's God, like, you know, okay, worship it. Right. Otherwise, we worship that K, uh, snake, which is in the cha snake charmer's basket, which is anyway injured. It's going right. to die for sure. Right. This has already been written on its head. Correct. But we should worship the snake, which is on the ground. We shouldn't get scared of everything. We should, 
uh, scream and we see a spider. You no, know, the spider is eating the mosquitoes in your house. You know, right. So learning to get amazed by these animals. You know, like oh wow, I have a spider. Let's walk carefully around it. You know, let's take the spider if I need to. I, if somebody can't tolerate it in the house, like how do we, in a humane manner, transport it out to another safer space? Right. So uh, I think we need to. Uh, um, uh, children's generation are definitely uh, getting more adept at learning to live with the urban wild. Right. Otherwise, we are fine if it's in Ban, uh, it's in uh, you know uh, Bandipur or Nagar Hole. We are fine. Okay, we'll go all the way to see all the wildlife. But no, it's right here, right now. Here right. in right. Bangalore, there's so much wildlife. Right. And what about some of the nicer things or the compassion things that people have done? Oh, we have a lot of beautiful stories as well. Um, we'll have people, firstly, we have a lot of like people who, if you've rescued a little bat, for example, it's baby, you need to feed it milk every, all through the night because bats um, uh, are awake in the night, right? So they will feed in the night as well. Right. So eternal creatures. So, you know, these little volunteers will stay awake and they'll use a little, uh, like a earbud or a little dropper and keep feeding bats and mammals. So they right. keep feeding it a drop of milk, cleaning it. And, um, and you know, this little bat uh, would cry each time the person would put it back, you know, into its little box. So right. and the moment they would open the box, it would come on, cling to the t-shirt and be fine. Right. So then they understood that, okay, we need to put a little, maybe a toy uh, next to it, you know, right. so that it can uh, right. uh, cling onto it. And then, and then it kept quiet. Right. We have um, like primates, you know, little uh, orphaned uh, monkeys a lot of people are really I mean willing to hold on to them and nurture them but that's not good for the monkey or the human you know they have to let go so maybe only in transit but very often people will spend a lot of hours of their time and to um, help that particular case at that right. time that's what right. I, I'm like very proud of you know, the Bangaloreans who go all the way Right, as you and should be. Sometimes we'll have people, you know, who will, uh, like, are working in a call center, you know, but they'll take a call break and go out and rescue that bird, put it in a little box, and bring it back into the office and keep it under their desk till the rescue team can reach them and pick the animal up. Right, right. What are some of the uh, unusual wildlife that you find in Bangalore? Uh, and uh, have you seen uh, perhaps decline or increase in some of these species in your 25 years of experience? Well, one is, uh, I would say my decline and uh, increase would be depending on my rescue statistics, right? Right. But the rescue earlier would be less also because of less awareness about us, right. less awareness of the network. And Correct. also it was not the digital age where you didn't have, you know, this kind of a networking. Now right. every person, even the roadside, uh, you know, coconut seller may have a cell phone. Right. So the network has increased. Our, our visibility, I hope, has increased. Right. So maybe the numbers are still high. I mean, I think we could do many, many more rescues, much more. Because Bangalore right. has loads of wildlife. And as the urban sprawl increases, that means that much of, wild area has been encroached upon like a bird which is flying it's used to a clear sky right but it can look at glass and see the reflection of the sky and think it's sky and fly into it so then it goes into concussion right. so you will need to pick up that bird and house it just keep it safe for some time and we need to like mark with a tape or something like a black tape right we need to mark our glass big glass panes you know, so right. birds don't fly, you know, they know it's, it's danger. It's not safe to fly into it. That's right. a big um, threat to our urban uh, birds. Right. And um, just now we had a spot built pelican. We've had um, a vulture, we've had owls, you know, people with owls, we had a bad story also because people used to have this superstition that if a uh, owl calls out, well, if my mother's called my, me by name and at the same time an owl calls, then it's a death knell to my me. My name was being called. So, you know, right. busting those myths and superstitions. Right. Uh, like on Nag Panchmi, now we invite people that 
hey, don't pour the uh, milk on a snake idol. You know, give it to here. We will call the orphanage children. The milk will go to them. We will get them books and stuff. And 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 then we have a whole section of what is Nag Panchmi, how to worship a snake. Worship it at PFA if you wish. You know, we have enough snakes. You know, worship by just conserving them. Basically, that's the idea. Right. Learning to live with them. Right. Right. And uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. You have something to add? Yeah. So I mean, that's one space we've created. You know, awareness. Um, right. Uh, for snakes, because snakes are the one creature that the, uh, the maximum myths abound. You know, and the fear. Fear is huge because it can be fatal. A uh, snake bite. Right. In fact, uh, that was one of the reasons why I came into this movement of wildlife. Right. Uh, many, many years when I read an article in a newspaper that, you know, a uh, child, a uh, St. Joseph's Boys High School student had died because of snake bite. And okay. getting into the story, I learned that, you know, the children were keeping snakes as pets. You could on Brigade Road get a snake for 10 bucks or something at the time. And these kids would just have it in their school bags or in little boxes or bottles and stuff. And the parents sometimes may not even know. And they would be, it was like a macho thing. It had become a rage amongst uh, teenage boys. Right. And right. one of them had gotten bitten by a crate. Right. But the crate is a hemotoxic. So like a neuro, uh, cobra is a neurotoxic. So it hurts, it pains intensely when a cobra bites you. But a crate's bite is, you may not even see it. It's so quick. That the bite you may not notice it's before in the within the blink of your eye, and the snake uh, bite marks are very faint. It could pass off as a hair follicle mark, okay. and uh, that child regretfully died. That's how I went to Saint Joseph to give talks. You know that why we should not keep snakes as pets. What is the laws regarding snake captivity? What is the and many children started handing over their snakes to me. That's how you know. That was the, one of the ideas that how we got into this uh, wildlife. Right. You know, we right. uh, became specialized in wildlife hospital. Right. And um, so, um, so snakes, I think, would. Um, what was I saying? So basically, you know, yeah. So. Um, you know, what was the original topic? I lost that string. I think we got into a lot of things. No, no, we got into a lot of things. Yeah. We were talking about uh, primarily about how we could, yeah, how so, we could be a little more, yeah, yeah. Oh, a no, little no. more empathetic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, you know, so understanding that you know, wildlife is not meant for captivity or as pets, and uh, you know, respecting them. Well, another example would be like, you know, when people who have a morbid fear of snakes, when they come to our shelter and they see, you know, our vets handling the snake and they, um, supposing they are, they become volunteers and then they're taken through the paces of how to rehabilitate animals and they help us and they touch a snake and they think it's a slimy creature, but they realize it's very dry and scaly mm. and uh, simple things like that, you know, then their fear, basically a lot of fear goes away from them when they right. address one fear. Right. Your fear of spiders or fear of any animal, you know, when you come and see, you have respect. You right. really learn to respect and see the beauty of them. Right. Because then they're not, it's not an unknown thing. It's a known thing right in front of you. Right. Fear is when it's unknown. Then the fears just keep on increasing. Right. I'm curious, would you attribute the fear that uh, we have, uh, you know, as adults or as kids, would you attribute it to the way um, our media, whether it's films, whether it's uh, you know, uh, uh, the way we kind of portray um, animals and the fear we associate with it. Do you think that's why we kind of have this whole uh, notion of, like you said, right? Like something as small as thinking the snake is slimy or, you know, you're scared of it, you know, or, or spiders and, you know, things like that. What, would, what do you think of that? I definitely, I agree with you because uh, if you see the rural people, they have a, a they are easy with animals. Yeah. It's more of us urban people, you know, because we have not seen them. Right. I mean, we may not have ever seen a snake, though it's right. living around us. We may never have noticed an owl, whereas right. there's so many owls. Right. You know, in Bangalore, we have so many owls. Right. And so um, once we don't know a creature, we tend to fear it. Right. And also our films, our media, you know, that definitely has added to, you know, you need the terror element, you no, know, in a film or story so Correct. the animals are vilified more easily right 
In fact, um, uh, if I could share a small anecdote, the first time I saw an owl, it was just a couple of uh, months ago. Like I first time saw an owl, I was standing at my balcony. I identified there was an owl and I'm kind of peeping to see, is it an owl? By the time I could like uh, figure out that it was an owl, the owl turned the head and kind of looked at me and I was spooked. Yeah, it was an experience that I will cherish for a while. But it was, um, it was the first time I saw, uh, I mean, I kind of encountered an owl that way. And, and you're right, I have seen a couple of owls uh, around here. Uh, yeah, you're in, lucky, you're lucky. It's a lucky sighting to see an owl and <laughs> to see it, you know, turn. and. Yeah, no, because it was perched and it was, you know, facing a different direction. And for some reason, correctly, when I came out, it turned the head and I was like, okay. Uh, so that was one experience. Uh, coming back to the conversation, uh, what you did bring up, uh, what I also want to talk about is when uh, I think one of the things you kind of emphasize on is uh, kind of promoting vegetarianism and uh, uh, kind of uh, how that is important. Could you talk to us a little about that? And we why it is promote vegetarianism on our platform. Okay. It's, I feel more individual choice, you know. Okay. Uh, with it's uh, how sensitive you feel and uh, what you want to protect whether you just want to do wildlife you want to do overall animals it's right. an individual choice it's okay. about you know each one should just look at oneself what i can do what more could i do and right. it's an internal calling right you know, so often you'll hear um, like once i had a person i mean i'm always get curious like somebody who's been a uh, not a vegetarian traditionally in the family and then suddenly they become vegetarian i'm like really amazed like why how what right. happened so that's an internal calling i feel right right and then if one wants to explore that path then there's so much of data available online nowadays you know Correct. about the horrors of farming factory farming i mean animal farming factory farming livestock so right that's there but we don't really actively Promote right. it. Okay, I might have missed because that a, Because the moment if I promote vegetarianism, then I'm also saying that only vegetarians come to me. You know, all the others stay away. So right. I'm actually dividing. I'm creating a divisive line. Right. I just want people. I just want humans to be humane. Right. And each one finds their own level. You know, what right. I'm doing today, I just need to do a bit more tomorrow. Correct. Correct. Then it's your own journey. Right. Uh. Okay, coming back a little more to uh, where we are today, you know, the last year has been a tough year. It was a pandemic and it was unprecedented times. Um, what were your findings uh, with the way, uh, you know, the wildlife kind of uh, interacted in its urban space? Uh, any particular findings that you'd like to share? Um, and what were your learnings through the pandemic with interaction with these wildlife, with the wildlife? when we had the lockdown, so our numbers came down because a lot of these uh, animals which are distressed or injured and they come to us, it's because of human interaction in a right. construction site or whether on a road people are driving, uh, it's human activity. So right. during the pandemic, the numbers of our calls, the rescue calls decreased. Also, right. there were less number of people out on the road, so less sightings. But I think right. it goes both ways that there were less injuries itself. Right. And um, but on the other hand, our manja cases went up. More people started flying the right. the yeah. site, the hobby with the, right. with on the hobby and with the synthetic. So it's an urgent and ardent plea that please don't use synthetic manja. It's not right. worth. It's not work. show your skill, show your sportsmanship with the true, you know, the plastic, um, the cotton thread. Cotton. You know, cotton manja, that's how it was in the olden days. Right. If you're skilled, you can cut another person's sight with the cotton. Right. And it's a plastic thing, anyone can cut it. Like you have to, then it's more on how good your equipment is. Right. You have to know how good am I at, you know. Right. Or resist from it. Find another sport which is more environment friendly. Right, right. And uh, how can uh, one get in touch with you if somebody wants to volunteer or if somebody, you know, sees an animal or a bird in distress? Uh, could you just tell us how does one or just, you know, like you mentioned, for perhaps schools to kind of get in touch to have a talk. So how would one get in touch? So we have uh, two helplines for the wildlife uh, rescues and anyone can call it. Uh, we have ensured that it's open 24-7, 365 days a year. At any okay. time of day or night, people can call us for any right. rescue. 
Right. So our rescuers are there around the clock. Our vets right. are there around the clock, you know, right. to tend to the animal. Right. So um, I think the public can always reach us then through um, if schools want to reach us, reach us and have a Zoom meeting for their students right. webinars. And uh, we've done a lot of webinars during the pandemic. Right. Our webinars increased and our student visits came down. Right. So, uh, but it's good because we have now we can reach out to anyone, anybody. Anywhere. But we are trying to, uh, like earlier, we had a lot of school visits to the government schools, you know, yeah. in, and we would give talks in Canada and right. uh, we would have slide presentations. And it was very exciting for the children, you know, to be able to see these animals and what happens. If a child sees, you know, a little squirrel is brought in and how it's fed milk, how it's nurtured from something as small as a little finger, you can't even recognize what is this creature. It just looks so slimy and uh, it could be anything. It looks like right. a snail, amoeba, something like that. Right. How it grows and matures and changes shape and the fur comes and it opens its eyes and, and how it develops into a squirrel. If they see that process, the their admiration, the respect and the awe and amazement goes up and they realize, oh, there is a hospital that I can take anything. Anything can become okay. Yeah. That feeling that that uh, confidence comes in the child so right. we have that you know we look out for volunteers interns you know children who are um, we would love to uh, visit schools to show you know that uh, veterinary sciences are a huge profession you know psychology of animal rehabilitation there's so much which can be done in that sphere right and and these are the ones who and then also the laws, you know, we need lawyers who can interact with us. How do we plead our cases better, stronger? How do we, like, you know, uh, litigation, how do we... So we need volunteers on legal front, on digital front, on design front, at the shelter to build, right. you know. Uh, these young kids come, they make these, they weave with the uh, broken branches and we give them some pattas. They weave little hammocks and beds for the animals and ladders and swings it's it's extremely um you know satisfying it's very satisfying right i think what we'll do is we will put out uh, you know your socials so people can reach out to you um, uh, at the end of this video i think we are almost reaching the end while we would love to have this conversation yeah, i could carry on talking endlessly there's yes, and i think we would we would love to listen endlessly as well but before we let you go I'd like to uh, ask you uh, perhaps uh, any advice that you could give us um, as individuals, the smaller things that we could do that could be a little more compassionate towards the urban wildlife, anything, the smaller things. So like now, one of the smallest things we can do, like now summer's coming for Bangalore, we would need to put out water. water. Uh, yeah. uh, even it could be in the ground for the ground creatures. It could be a little pot on a window or a veranda or a terrace for the birds. Uh, we could even put up little boxes, you know, just uh, one side little open as a nesting box for owls. You've right. seen an owl, right? right. So it's nested somewhere. So now we, earlier we would have like tiled roofs and, you know, stone. We would have more crevices and uh, niches for animals to house. So right. now that's disappearing. So right. we can create these little things. We could put our little seeds, um, uh, you know, just for creatures to come and take. Right. Um, and one is uh, encourage, uh, not disturb a nest. You know, if you right. see a nest, it's okay. Yeah. How to live, you know, it's a matter of time where the nest will just, the birds or the creatures will mature and leave. Correct. Correct. Right. Yes, I think if, if you guys heard her, so there are a lot of things that we could do. Last but definitely not the least. Uh, like I said, it has been a tough year and we've all gone through a lot of things last year. If you could leave us with something that you've been grateful from for last year or something that kept you optimistic the previous year, uh, maybe that would help us stay in uh, a little more uplifted spirits. So I think even though our space is wildlife where we work, last year what was really encouraging, uh, we were feeding the strays of Bangalore, the stray dogs and cats on the roads. And a lot of volunteers right. came together and uh, people donated food and, and that happened in a really good way. And uh, because right. of the pandemic, people, you know, couldn't take the pets to here and there, you know, like the auto rickshaws were refusing, you know, there was a the, uh, terrible misinformation or disinformation that pets could create, uh, would uh, uh, can, um, yeah. infect you with Infected COVID. By the, yes. People were abandoning. Them. So we even started a small pet clinic at shelter to okay. service, you know, the locality. 
and we also have a, a you know pet cemetery at, uh, at at we have a huge amount of land you know so that was another service we started because that has a humane angle if you if my pet is can be like my family member and mostly it's like the baby of the family yeah. now when that goes then you can't just have a bbmp van coming and you dump it and that's, you know when i lost my first pet and that's how it went and i was really felt really bad and then when we got the opportunity, lady had come and she wanted to bury her pet in PF. And I said, yeah, that's a damn good idea. Let's, then that's how the pet cemetery had started many, many, many years ago. And now the uh, Animal Welfare Board of India has also mandated all animal shelters to have a service, you know, because it's inhumane to the humans to see yeah. the pet going away in an undignified manner. Yeah. So that is a service we are doing. And I think it's good. Last year has been a good year for us to learn the value of wildlife. I hope everyone's learned that, you know, how important it is not to capture wildlife. What happens when wildlife is stressed, you know, in yeah. Wuhan, that's what happened, you know, the bats, the civets, and, and, and they're all being, uh, they're not meant to be taken out of their zone, the wild zone and kept in captivity. That stress really... So we've learned what does stress, what stress does to captive animals. Animal. Yeah. Stress is a real killer. So it mutates, it, it goes, turns into monsters. Yeah. So we need to be aware. I think it's a big learning lesson for entire, all of us. Right.